a couple more to to join. Um, we're expecting quite a few this evening, so I'll just wait to get going. Look at that flying now. About over a hundred in, so we're just waiting on a few, aren't we? Okay. Yeah, I've got 107. Good to go. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, let's um let's get cracking. So, welcome everybody to the EFA's webinar series and tonight's uh, topic around exploring biases in decision making. Thanks ever so much for joining us. Um, I guess the first thing to say is my name is David Court. I'm the performance education lead at the FA. Um, my role involves leading the talent ID education pathway from level one through to through to level five, um, as well as leading the performance education team across uh, different disciplines. So working in coach education um, around the AYA, A license and the pro license. Um, we're joined tonight by Chris Marshall, a good friend of mine and colleague. Um, Chris um, is one of the psychologists that works with the national teams, um, working across predominantly the professional development phase. Um, and this year is focusing on the England of the 19 squad. So welcome, Marshy. Um, the other thing to say about Marshy, which not many people know, although unless you speak to him, you'll find out very quickly. Um, he is the psychologist for the two time heavyweight champion of the world, Anthony Joshua. So big up to, Mar to you, Marshy, for, for your work with him. Um, the other person you can see on the bottom of the screen is, is Matt. Matt Ramsbottle is the um, one of our Game Insights um, people at the FA and working in FA education. Um, he's going to look after us tonight from a technology perspective. Um, so any problems kind of Matt will be able to hopefully fix. Um, one of the first things we'll say is, um, this is obviously due to be at St George's Park. We run it at St George's Park normally, but due to current circumstances, um, it's it's closed down. So we're running it from from our own homes. It's the first time we've run it from our own homes. We had a test earlier. Everything went well. Um, so so fingers crossed it will go well again tonight. But any problems, please just bear with us while we while we work through those. Um, so I guess the um, the other thing to say at the start is we want you to participate. So at the top of the screen, you'll see the um, the the chat box. Please feel free to put comments in there, questions, things you want for clarity. Um, and also in the top right, you'll see the handouts. And in a minute, I'll share with you um, kind of, in fact, we'll do it later in the presentation where we'll give you the handouts from today's presentation. So you'll have you'll have all the slides. Um, so the first thing is, I guess, a couple of rules to how we get the best out of this and how, the, how you can get the most out of it. Um, I guess it's the same as any other learning opportunity, really. So we're going to present some ideas, have some discussion, um, hopefully stimulate some thinking. Um, the challenge for you is to, to contextualize that, think about what it means to you and your situation, your club, wherever you're working, um, and try and make the links between the theory and the, the kind of ideas we're talking about this evening into practice and what it means to what it means to your club. Um, I'd encourage everyone to make notes as they go, as they would if you're sat face to face. Um, I think that's a really important part of, of learning how we can kind of consolidate our thinking um, and hopefully make it make it more sticky for a longer period of time. As I said at the start, please ask questions right the way through. Um, we'll try and provide answers. What we won't necessarily do is be able to answer every question straight away, um, but we'll try and make some time at the end to, to answer any questions any questions you may have. Um, I guess the first thing says why why this topic why why biases in decision making um, and the first thing to say is it's a I guess it's a hot topic within talent ID within football um, I guess since the advent of books like the Moneyball um, and ideas that perhaps data um, and um, computers might make more informed decisions than, than human beings um, which we certainly don't subscribe to and we'll explore a little bit more in, in a bit but it's certainly a hot topic for people to discuss um, around what are biases what is this thing called biases and how we can and how we can kind of work to ensure that they don't affect negatively the work the work we're doing um, in terms of um, what we're trying to do in learning outcomes I guess tonight we just want to provide an, an overview of some of the biases that you may see how they may play out in your world and the other thing is trying to maybe have a little bit of fun as we go through. Um, so hopefully you'll um, you'll enjoy it. You'll take something from it and think about um, and think about yourselves and your own work in practice moving forward. OK, so that's probably enough of me. You'll probably want to hear from 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 one of the guys that knows a bit more about it. So, Marcia, do you want to just talk to us about kind of what what are biases in the first place? 
Thank you, Courtney. And uh, again, thank you everyone for taking your time your time this evening. Uh, apologies if, if if the Wi-Fi does drop out, um, but we'll do everything we can to make sure it it, it works fine. Um, biases uh, for me, I, I look. I'm, I love this topic. It, for me, it's it's such a fascinating topic to talk about because it's um, it's something that impacts our everyday life. Every single decision we make has an element of bias, or what we'll talk about very briefly, sort of heuristics to it. Um, and for me, it's a really, really important part, um, a place to place to start. I want to step back and I want to step back a little bit from biases. And I want to explain this, this word that you've seen a couple of times now, this idea of heuristics. And I want to talk about that briefly before we get into bias. Quite simply, heuristics, as you can see on the screen, are the mental shortcuts that we have in order to speed up our decision making. If we can think about it from an evolutionary process, our brain is trying to reduce energy consumption all of the time. It doesn't want to be thinking heavily about every single decision that you have to make. So it creates lots of shortcuts. And that's where the term bias then comes in. The heuristic is the shortcut for every decision that we make. A bias is when we have this error or prejudice typically that occurs from, from a heuristic. Let me give you a, a couple of simple examples to try and describe a heuristic and then we can build into some of the biases as we as we go through. Um, first time you drove a car, imagine if you can take yourself back to that first time you got in, in a vehicle. You would have sat down, you would have had your driving instructor sat next to you, and you've had a little bit of anxiety about what you need to do. You sat there, you put your foot on your clutch, you drop it into first gear, and you have to do a huge amount of thinking about where's the biting point, mirror, signal, maneuver. Your brain is taking in lots of information at every single period of time. The more times you learn to, sorry, the more times you spend in that car, the more time you spend driving, the more automatic it becomes. That's a wonderful example of a heuristic. That's exactly where this mental shortcut has come from. It takes time to build, but once you've done it, I guarantee you, every one of you that can drive, you don't even think about a hill start now when you're sat in your car and you're trying to find that biting point. It just happens automatically. Now that is the same thing, whether we're learning to drive, whether we're making a decision on a player, whether we're making a cup of tea, everything that we do is boiled down to its simplest form. And these rules of thumb that we operate are simply there to help us reduce our energy consumption. Okay, so just, just so I'm crystal clear, Matthew, so you're saying that they're not, like the biases isn't necessarily always the thing that happens, it's a heuristic, and then the potentially negative impact of that heuristic might be termed a bias. Is that is that right, have I got that right? Yeah, you have. Um, and and I would also I also make the point that biases aren't always particularly unhelpful. Um, we're going to talk about them in, today in a way um, we're going to talk about things such as confirmation bias, for example, and, and how it plays out when we, when we are looking at players. Um, they're there for a reason, as I've talked about, to help speed things up. But I also don't want to lose what is outstanding intuition um, that, that skilled coaches, skilled scouts, skilled talent reporters have when we have it. Biases are typically errors in judgment, but sometimes they are quite useful. And that's where I think some of the ambiguity, the ambiguity sits. OK, because that's that's interesting. So if people start talking about heuristics more. That is the experiences that have built up that may well be positive, that gain kind of deep insight into players. But I yeah. guess the word bias often has this negative connotation, doesn't it? That it's we're biased, we're bad is the, is the kind of rhetoric, isn't it? Yeah, and it is. And we do typically talk about biases leading to errors in judgment. Um, and hopefully as we go through, uh, go through this next sort of hour or so, hour and a half, we'll start to see where maybe they are sometimes useful, but also maybe where they do trip us up a little bit. And that's going to be really important. OK, cool. Interesting. Well, let's get stuck into asking some questions of the, of the guys and, and girls and see what see what the view is. So I've got a first question for you, which is should flash up on your on your screen, which is is understanding biases important within talent ID and football? Um, so hopefully it'll pop up and you'll be able to give us an answer. Brilliant, we've got some responses. Wow. So just for just for just for your guys' perspectives, um, what we um, what we can see, the three of us now, is answers to all of these these questions popping up. And uh, I'm hoping that yeah. Wow, it's flying through now, Courtney. Yeah. Got 123 in the room. We're close. We're close to everyone actually. Yeah. 
Fantastic. Okay, great. Well, that's that's really interesting. So hopefully we're all in the right place um, because 96 percent have said, yes, they are important within talent identification in, in football. And five percent of people are not sure, which is which is great. So no one said no, they're not important. So kind of understanding our biases and understanding of biases as, are important. So the question I've now got, which is hopefully taking this a bit deeper, is kind of why? Why are they important? So just I, I urge you just as a, a minute, we'll have a, a minute on your own. Um, if you can write it in a chat box, that'd be great. But why do you think they're important? Like everyone said that they are important. Let's think about why. Mm -hmm. So just given the obviously amount of people, I think it's on a bit of a delay. So there's 130 in the room. So they'll start to come in now as we've done. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. And I and I want to try and th get you to think about your own context for this. So why is it important in my context and where I work? Mm, absolutely. I'll start talking. I mean, I'll give my perspective while people are starting to um, starting to uh, write some stuff in the chat. And um, uh, one of the things I, I, I'm always fascinated in as a psychologist is is how people make decisions, uh, how people come to a come to a conclusion. Um, so when you finally make that decision to to sign a player, when you get to a stage where actually you're buying a car, buying a house. What you're going to wear in the morning like we make so many decisions and if we can start to really understand some of your own biases the things that lean you towards players then we can get into a position to recognize are we making what would be the best decision at this period of time and and look we'll, we'll talk about this as we as we go through if you can start to really really understand what you what you like dislike and the impact that will have on your decision making with players. If we can do that, then I think we find ourselves in a really, really good position to make some informed decisions. Completely agree. And there's some really interesting comments in the, the chat box about exploring what strengths and weaknesses players have, allowing you to see players that other people may not have seen, um, understanding your own personal biases and where they come from, um, mm -hmm. to be able to have objective views on players. Really, really good, really good stuff. Mm -hmm. OK, so we um, while people keep cracking on with that, let's um, let's start with, our, I guess, our first bias, really, and start to unpick this, um, hopefully, in a, in a fun way. Mm -hmm. Definitely, mate, definitely. So we're going to have a little bit of fun. Now, you don't necessarily need to write your answer down. If you don't want to, you can. That's absolutely fine. But I want to emphasize how quickly um, we come to make a decision. So if a baseball and a bat cost one pound ten together and the bat costs one pound more than the ball how much does that ball cost now have a little think um start to kind of formulate your own ideas if you want to be bold and brave drop it into the chat box if you want to just sit with it that's <laughs> absolutely fine i'll give you another sort of 10 more seconds or so oh here we go oh, 10 feet, five feet. they're coming in 13 minutes past seven and i didn't think they'd be doing maths but there we go. <laughs> yeah. 10p, 5p, 10p, 5p. 5p. A bit of a split, aren't we? We are a big split. 10p, 5p, 1p. Oh, here we go. Okay. So straight away, let's get back to the principle that I spoke about earlier. This idea that our brain wants us really, really quickly to give an answer. We're starting to get lots of five piece through here and I'm really, really happy. So you look at that and intuitively your first response, the first thing that your brain is gonna tell you is 10p. Then when you think it through, when you go through, hang on, let me read this through and spend a little bit more time on it. If a baseball and a bat cost one pound 10 together and the bat costs one pound more than the ball, how much would the ball cost? Well, in that instance, the ball has absolutely has to cost has to cost 5p the reason for that is it's, it's the one pound more than the ball that means that the bat costs one pound 5p and the ball is therefore 5p but because of our brain's desire to want to make decisions quickly in order for us to move on we will very quickly go our oh, 10p move on 10p move on we have to spend some time thinking that through in order for us to be in a position to make a really, really accurate decision in this instance. 
So that's that's really interesting, Marcia. So you're saying that like in every kind of everyday activities, we're trying to make shortcuts to make things as quick and easy as possible. Um, yeah. And yeah, that's, no, our, no, no, that's we are. our default position. That's our default way of operating. It, it, no, it absolutely is. And I don't want to keep labouring the point because uh, I think there's some more fascinating stuff we can, we can keep talking about. But if we do just have that principle in our head as we go through this, is that actually our brain is trying to help us it's trying to be in the, when we're making decisions it's trying to help us by doing it quickly sometimes it will it will let us down and that's okay okay great so look let's keep that in mind as we go through um and i'm looking forward to this next bit um we had a look at it earlier and it made me um i enjoyed it then so marcia do you want to get us cracking with the next next activity yeah, I will. So we said right at the beginning that we wanted to try and make this um, quite interactive and quite fun. And I, I want to I want to really emphasize one particular point that as human beings, we are um, very, very susceptible to. And that is the labels that we will put on people. So we're going to we're going to play a, a very, very uh, well, a short video. You did not think that you'd be on an F.A. Uh, um, webinar this evening watching a bit of Britain's Got Talent but I want you all to put your scouts heads on your coaches heads on whatever head it is that you play I want you to try and uh, get yourself in that role now the poll is going to pop up again in a second and we're going to have a little bit of debate about this and I'm going to stop and start the video so bear with us we hope this will work um, but let's just see hello hello there what's your name my name's Jenny Darren Nice to meet you, Jenny. Where are you from? I'm from the Cotswolds. Oh, I love the Cotswolds. You 10 seconds of Jenny Darren from the Cotswolds. Court is going to pop up a, a poll in a second. And the question is a really, really simple one. Should we, um, should we play again, Rashi, first? Just yeah, make sure everyone's got it. Make sure everyone's got it. Hello there. What's your name? My name's Jenny Darren. Nice to meet you, Jenny. Where are you from? I'm from the Cotswolds. Oh, love the Cotswolds. Okay, so you played it twice. Jenny Darren from the Cotswolds. Is Jenny talented? Is Jenny talented? Please submit your votes, yes or no. I feel like a judge now. It's amazing, <laughs> isn't it? Okay. I, I honestly, actually, I feel like, do you remember when you said those totalizers? When I, I can't think what it would have been like on Comet Relief and stuff, and you see those totalizers racking up. Yeah. I feel like we're on the totalizer. Oh, we're looking at 70 30 split at the minute. Amazing. Okay, great. So, yeah, almost exactly a 70 30 split. Exactly 70-30. So what I find really, really fascinating this as a psychologist is that we've seen 10 seconds of a human being. And I know we've kind of forced you, well, we have, I say kind of, we have, we've forced you to make a decision about whether you think somebody is talented or not. I guarantee you when you were sat at home on your sofa watching Britain's Got Talent, um, if you did watch Britain's Got Talent or The X Factor, you would have sat there and gone, oh, I wonder, I wonder if she's going to be any good. We are automatically inclined to have an opinion on another human being in front of us so 70 percent of you think jenny's going to be talented and 30 percent of you um do not think that she's going to be talented i'm going to press play and we're going to carry on and we're going to see how we get on with this next little bit do you have a day job no i'm retired how old are you if you don't mind me asking i'm 68 and jenny are you doing this because you think you can win the show Absolutely. That's what it's about. Of course. Okay, Jenny, good luck. Oh, Chunk oh, again. Love the Cotswold. Do you have a day job? No, I'm retired. How old are you, if you don't mind me asking? I'm 68. And Jenny, are you doing this because you think you can win the show? Absolutely. That's what it's about. Of course. Okay, Jenny, good luck. So, so a little bit like when you're scouting, 
or when you're looking at players. You've got a little bit more data now, a little bit more information. Have you changed your opinion? And there's some good questions people are asking if they've seen it before and knowing the sort of this the construct of the show marshy that's that's fair comments isn't it mate really really fair comments and i think that this all again we're thinking about how we come how we make decisions in this instance and all of this extra information is um is part of how we do it what do we know about the show do they typically have big build-ups of people that are good do they have big build-ups of people that are maybe a bit of a car crash um like how does this how does this play out and we all now start to get in a position where we're gathering data from lots of positions um and again looking at that so we've had tw we've had 12 percent of people have changed their opinion but 88 percent of people have absolutely stuck with no we still think that jenny is talented and I, I will qualify it with one thing um what is she talented at was asked as a question uh, singing singing is the answer we are we are going for so let's carry on Okay, Jenny. Okay, just bear with me, campers. Oh, and there's more. Absolutely. I'm, that's what it's about. Of course. Okay, Jenny, good luck. Okay, Jenny, good luck. Okay, just bear with me, campers. Okay, so we've given him a big build up, <laughs> big, big build up. What is your final answer? Are you going to change your mind further? Yes or no? So whilst people are gathering their thoughts on this, let's go into it a little bit more detail. Why are we showing you um, Britain's Got Talent on a football decision-making exploring biases webinar? Um, the, the first thing we do when we're looking at human beings is put a label on them. We might say somebody is tidy, organized, smart, professional. They've got a good attitude. They're a hard worker. Whatever it is we do is we put a label on someone. That bias is known as the fundamental attribution error. We attribute their behavior to something that we believe to be important. And what that means is, is that, that from that starting point, we find ourselves in a position where we are already now biased in one way or the other towards a human being. What I absolutely love about this clip is this lady, Jenny from the Cotswolds, who someone I alluded to is a wonderful place to live, um, has not yet executed her skill, yet there will be multiple views around whether we think Jenny is talented or not. And for me, that's what really, really applies in the world of uh, talent identification. It's what are the labels that we are putting on people which are going to have an impact on how we view them, how we see them, and, and the stories that we ultimately ultimately tell about them and actually that that makes great, great sense to me so in terms of like how quickly we make these judgments so there's some good comments in the in the chat around like seven seconds and i've read some stuff around interviews that it's it's the first three seconds of an interview where people have made a judgment um on you and they've made a they put a label on, on what they think you are um is that something that happens in all instances is it possible to, sub, to suspend this yeah no no absolutely and, and this is something that like, 
it's not something we can stop doing fundamentally, um, but it's something we can be really, really aware of. Um, there are, we're going to go through it as we go through the webinar and we talk about different, uh, different biases and the impact it has on your, your, your sort of recruitment and your recruitment policy and discussions you have about players and stories that you tell, et cetera, et cetera. But for me, the fundal attribution error is a great example of a bias, which means that we um, put a label on somebody when we see them, which then ultimately has an impact. And I think I can see David's comment that's just popped up on the chat there, can't possibly judge until you see the performance. And that is absolutely right. But you'd be surprised about how many people do judge even before they've seen the, the skill that they're looking, to, they're looking to go and see. And again, that's just built into, um, into our fundamental ways that we operate as human beings and, and the way in which we make decisions. So in a football context, that could be things like how they appear, what they, what, how they wear their kit, what boots they wear, um, how they interact with others before before kickoff. It could be as, as, as fundamental as that. Yeah, definitely. And that is hugely impacted on what your beliefs and values are as a human being typically going into it. Okay, brilliant. And good good question from Elliot for, for clarity here around the fundamental attribution areas. You're saying that those labels we put on them, we're then attributing them to that person's character. Is that That's right, isn't it? Yeah, it is. So one thing that we're, we're very, very good as human beings at judging ourselves on our intentions and others on their behaviour. Fundamentally, we don't know what other people's intentions are, but we will always judge ourselves on intent. And the story that always gets told about fundamental attribution error is the idea of uh, road rage. So as soon as you get cut up when you're driving home from work, you automatically will shout expletives pretty much at the human being that's cut you up in front. Because that behaviour to you is unfair, it's erratic, and you move on. But if you cut somebody else up, that's okay because you were in a rush because you were late to you were late to pick up your little boy from school. You know your intentions, you don't know theirs. That's the label you put them on as careless, as un, uh, as disrespectful, as an idiot, whatever label you want to you want to use. But for you, if you cut in front of somebody driving home, that's kind of okay because you know what your intentions are. That's a really really great example of it of it showing up. Okay, great. Well, should we should we have some answers? And guys are obviously keen to see how how Jenny performs to make their yeah. to make their judgment whether she's whether she's talented or not. So let's roll this through for a second, and then we'll just get into a bit bit more. I, I will only play this through this through once this little bit, so um, we'll let it play because hopefully you should get you should get a feel about whether she's any good or not. How good is that? So those of you that said yes were right, is that right? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean look, I think someone we've got we've got a few a few comments in here about we've got we've got a Susan Boyle fan. Um, absolutely a, a really um, a really classic case of um, of fundamental attribution error at, at, at play. Um, I think that was a really, really a, again a really, really good example. Um, uh, would she be classed as talent if she wasn't in the sixties? Again, uh, we, we we all all of a sudden start applying uh, our sort of uh, our biases to 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 what we what we see. 
And that's one thing that we'll highlight there. Oh, sorry, Cordy, yeah, you're right. No, no, I was just going to say, like some of the comments around um, talent, it is contextual. Um, it depends on what you're looking for, what you're looking at, what your needs are. Um, so absolutely right. If we were looking for a, um, a Formula One racing driver and she turned up singing, we're probably not going to say she's talented. So it is contextual. So having an understanding of what we mean by talent, and Marcia, we'll talk a bit later about shared mental models, um, is going to really help us with our with our biases and with our thinking. So, um, yeah, so just yeah, just just to clarify then, Marcia, for us, the fundamental attribution error. Yeah, it's a tendency we have to attribute people's behaviour to their character rather than the situational factors. So like really simply, we put labels on behavior. It's how we operate, it's how we communicate, it's how we work with each other. And for me, that that's absolutely, absolutely crucial. Okay, great. So um, I guess the, the thing now is to try and explore some of the other biases that are at play when we're, when we're looking at footballers and when we're trying to think about who we should select and who should we get opportunity to. Um, so before we do that, um, just, just kind of, Marshall, just run through this one for us. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, ultimately, in that activity that we just did, it, 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 it sort of tells us a couple of things. Um, and, and, and you know what? The, 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 one of the comments there about is, um, her performance is still subjective. Look, we love to make decisions. We love to make decisions quickly. Uh, that's how we operate. It's how we want to work. Uh, and we, we, we do it um, really, really quickly. Um, Okay, so quick question for everyone. So we're going to look at some other biases that are at play. So um, if you can write it in the chat box again, so what other biases have you heard of um, that might be at play? So this is a big topic. I think there was a book that was 105 different biases or, or whatever it is. Um, just have a, have a think about some of the other biases you may have heard of. Let's get some in the old chat box. Sean's point um, there is, is fundamental attribution error in its in its entirety, isn't it? A lack of perceived there. professionalism can create biases or exclusion in most cases, especially with certain races. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That laziness that's often perceived of, uh, uh, well, unhelpfully perceived actually, of the Afro Caribbeans, that laid back nature that can often be perceived. I think that's a really, really, um, it's a really, really good point. So lots of people saying unconscious bias. Um, yeah. Do you want to answer that one? Yeah, so I mean, look, so I mean, all biases are unconscious. Um, so we, we talk about that. We're going to talk about some particular biases today. We'll talk about um, um, confirmation bias, bandwagon effects. We're going to talk about, we've talked about fundamental attribution error already. Um, but yeah, look, there's, there's, some, there's some great examples there. Hindsight bias, um, I've seen pop up there. When we talk about people's size and weight and height and stuff, yeah, absolutely, it, it, it really does apply. People's ethnicity completely. We do have biases at, at certain times. Um, availability heuristic, I highlighted that, absolutely. And I think availability heuristic for me is a, is a really fascinating one. And it's actually quite a, quite a pertinent one, is that actually there will be lots of people now who will feel as though they are experts in the coronavirus. Um, because of the availability of information that we have on that on this on this disease, um, who you listen to is now going to be a fascinating decision uh, around that. But the availability of information is is leading people to have huge amount of biases biases towards that. Okay, cool. So let's um, these are some of the some of the biases that that we can think of. There's loads more that you guys have spoken about, um, and we're going to talk about some of these in more detail. And um, one of the things um, I should have mentioned at the start is we've compiled a reading list for people that will be in the handouts afterwards. So if people are interested in this subject in more detail, um, we've put some books, some podcasts and some videos that you might be able to access to, to get a bit deeper into this topic. So um, when the handouts come up um, a bit later, you'll be able to access those links and, and those readings. Um, yeah. So, OK, should we, um, should we crack on with the, with the next bias, Marshall? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. So. One thing that I will recognise and we'll talk about is particularly when we're scouting players and we're, and we're looking to make decisions on players is this stuff can tend to happen in a little bit in a little bit of an order um, uh, that we put a label on people. We then have elements where we confirm or deny, which is a confirmation bias. We'll then touch on how the halo and horn effect has an impact on it. And then finally, the bandwagon and the sort of the stories that the stories that we that we that we tell. 
Okay, so just just so I'm clear that they can happen in a kind of cascade in a in a process where we we put a label on someone, we then um, are then affected by a confirmation bias, which then subsequently leads on to the halo horn effect and then the bandwagon. So it kind of happens step by step. Yeah, absolutely. And and then what I will say is that um, a couple of mentors of mine wrote a wrote a book called uh, called Pig Wrestling from guys called Mark Borden and Pete Lindsay. Pete Lindsay, which isn't on the uh, on the um, on the reading list that we put out. Um, but they talk about it when it comes to how you make effective decisions and, and happening in this sort of order as well. So that's another another little reference that that people can people can have a look at. Okay, great. So should we crack? Let's have a look at confirmation bias as our first stop. Yeah, let's do it. So I think this is probably one that a lot of people have heard about and 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 um, and will definitely be on um, uh, on people's minds. And and confirmation bias tends to come out, and you'll you'll hear it. And you'll see it with people say things like i told you so it is absolutely called the brain's tendency to seek information that confirms their pre-existing beliefs so we look to find things that confirm what we be um, what we believe to be true um so let's let's sort of play it play it through a little bit we've got a view that a player is professional or we've got a player uh, let's let's sorry let's take a different example professionalism is always one that people go for let's say you go to a game and you've you've heard um, or you've been made aware that um, one of the attacking players is absolutely fantastic with his um, with his ball at his, with the ball at his feet, um, really great in one-to-one -one situations, and travels with the ball really well. So you've heard that, and you've also heard that from from someone that you trust and someone that you've got a decent a decent view on, uh, a decent view on a player that you respect. So that label is already on that player. You then turn up at the game. And it might not happen in the first half. They may not travel with the ball particularly well as you thought, and you kind of start to dismiss it, and you don't necessarily see it in the way that you'd that you'd like to. We then move on, and um, second half, twenty minutes in, that player travels with the ball beautifully, takes on two or three men, and, and has a and has a wonderful sort of final ball. That's exactly. See, I told you, I knew we were to expect that. Actually, in these instances, it confirms what we believe to be true. We've got confirmation bias at play. And even if there are examples where it didn't happen in the earlier part of the game, we're likely to delete that if we've got a pre-existing quite positive label about that player, which then means when we see it, we like it, we reference it, and then we sort of, away we go. Okay, so that's interesting. So it can work in both a positive and negative way, either us looking for the positive we see in someone and confirming that view, or the negative where um, we knew I knew they were lazy because they didn't make a recovery run, um, and there they go again. They're not doing it, so it's, it can happen both sides of the coin. Is that is that right? Yeah, definitely, definitely. So like, that's the other example, isn't it? Is when you, you hear people that they're, they're not great out of possession and they don't make great recovery runs, for example. Yeah, um, and that's it. There's a good point there around um, with one of the guests saying it sounds like we need to be careful with fundamental attribution error because what we make in that and what we label in those first instances become what we confirm later. Uh, yeah. I th <laughs> I'm not. I mean, it's, it's a shame we can't see that person's name. We just see guests because, it, for me, that it's the labels that we put on people have a huge impact on the stories that we then tell. And uh, when we do when we do this session, we do it in front of a room of uh, a room of people, and we've done it on the level three and the level four. Um, when we when we've done this session before, we often get the room to say, "Well, come on, what are the labels that you use to describe players?" And you, the, the, I mean, you guys know, you guys that are, that are listening, you guys yeah. understand that there are hundreds and hundreds of labels that get used to describe players. Some of these are, are really positive. Some of these are, are particularly unhelpful. And sometimes when you're with friends, you might use, you might use labels that you wouldn't probably use um, with, other, with other people. I often think about it, well, imagine if that was your son or your daughter, that you, that you heard that that label was being described about what impact that would have on um have on you and uh the, the the carefulness and the sort of the the clarity that you choose to use that label in those early instances of your interaction for me is really really important for the impact that we have moving forward okay and what what things can we do to try and uh, avoid this confirmation bias or do we need to avoid it is it just part of who we are and our gut feeling like what's what sort of things do you think might might help us? Yeah, I, I mean, it is part of who we are, and I don't want to necessarily use that as a bit of a, a cop out of, a, of an answer. Um, it is absolutely part of uh, part of who we are, what we see, what's important. Um, 
I, I'm, I'm going to sound like a broken record as we go through this quarter. I apologize for that. Like your your genuine ability to recognize and notice it is 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 really really important. Um, if you can start to notice, um, oh. If you can start to notice uh, the imp sorry, I'm getting a lot of uh, feedback here. Yeah. Sorry. Um, sorry. I mean, I've muted him. Yeah. Try again, Chris. Okay, sorry, I'll get a lot of feedback then. Um, yeah, we if we can start to notice yeah. what our biases are, the things that we particularly look for in players then we can be in a really, really helpful position to, to start to mitigate against it a little bit. I think it's Corty, it wasn't you, Chris. I think we've lost Corty. I think Corty might have, uh, might need to get some new headphones. So I'm going to carry on without him for a, for a second. You said, can you hear him? There you go, carry on, Chris. Yeah, let's um, let's get Corty to get some new headphones. So, um, so I want to do a little activity with you again, uh, and let's have a little bit of a think about um, about what sort of confirmation bias might look like and how it and how it might feel. So, I've asked you to imagine you've gone to this game, and you've gone to the game, and you've been told that. Um, uh, the main goalkeeper, Zentner, is not particularly good in possession. Tell me what you think would happen once you've seen this. Amazing. Let's watch it again. I love this video. I love this video for a few reasons, because I think we've all been there. We've all been there when um, a coach has kicked a white disc on the floor or something hasn't quite gone the way we'd want it to go. Um, and as, as it's been highlighted, it says he mistook the penalty spot for the ball. And if you if you just see that and you see that in one instance and you see that uh, you see a, um, a keeper do that and you're watching in the, in, the, in the stands, actually, you might think, yeah, do you know what? I've heard that you're, he's not particularly good in possession. And absolutely. Here's a great example. Now, he um, he may um, he may uh, have had three or four wonderful decisions in the early part of the game in possession, some simple passes where it works really, really well for him. Um, however, that one instance where he gets it completely wrong, if you've got the view already, the label is that he's not very good in possession, is that I told you so. And there's that sort of um, uh, confirmation bias. But but Scott, you're absolutely right. Wonderful reaction after that mistake, which uh, which he, uh, he, solves, he solves brilliantly. And unfortunately, they don't concede, which is which is great. And for me, it's a really nice example of confirmation bias at play. Yeah, man. I guess these are so my head. He's still trying to charge his headphones. Yeah, Court is <laughs> uh, no. uh, yeah. not, not in a great way there, is he? So I'm going to give you another example of where it sort of it sort of looks and um, uh, and, and again it shows exactly how in our brain the way our, the way our, our brain works is that once it creates a pattern it's very very difficult to um, to remove. So you've got the FedEx logo in front of you. Um, some of you may have seen this before. You may not have seen it before. Um, the FedEx logo is quite famous because it's got something inbuilt into it. Does anyone know what the FedEx logo has got inbuilt into it? Feel free to add it.
Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's the arrow. So if I start to draw for people that can't see it. So we've got a lot of feedback in the arrow, the art. Back in, Chris. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. So there we go. There is the art. It's the arrow. Uh, and for me, that's really, really important because now we, if I get rid of that, for those of you that hadn't seen it before, you can now not see that. You can, sorry, you can now not not see that. Um, it is stuck in your head, it is there, and it will be there um, for every time that you see it. So it's a really nice example of where confirmation bias is absolutely at play. We now see it, we can't unsee it, and we are, we are ultimately stuck with it. So, uh, Marsh, you guys need to be charged. Um, no. So I guess the power is... Modern technology and all that, eh? So we need to get a little message to Courtney, don't we, that he just needs to probably just take his headphones off. I've got mine plugged out now. Yeah. Done it. So we want to ask you guys a question. Again, want to try and keep it reasonably interactive. Um, when do you recognize this in other people then? So when do you see confirmation bias at play? And I, we'd really like to see a few examples of how this sort of shows up in your context. Uh, and then maybe we can have a little bit of a, a little bit of a tweak and I could probably try and share, share a few more examples. So in that, uh, in that chat box, if you can answer a couple of those questions for us. That would be, um, that would be brilliant. Yep, got you, Corey. Yeah, I think that's a really nice one, isn't it? So when you when you maybe you might read something about a player before you go and see them, whether they've been really, really emphasized positively or, or negatively. Yeah. Media, yeah, definitely. That's a really good example. Assuming. Oh, you might just have to stay on mute at this rate. Right, no. Courtney, we might need you to um to sign out, mate, and come back in again. Um I think that's a really, really good example, the one that I can see there. I can't see, quite see the name, but uh, when you start working at a new club, the first thing people will tell you is everything about players. Yeah, he's a brilliant player. Again really really good examples of where look excuse me not necessarily unhelpful always but those labels that people put on them will definitely have an impact on um uh, definitely have an impact on, on your view of them and how that sort of plays out so we, we talked a little bit about the fact that there's i mean the, the sort of these slides are all about the sort of method in your method in your madness uh, we just don't always we don't, just don't always know it um, and know about it. Um, once we put a label on somebody, and then we um, start to see examples of the confirmation bias, um, we can find ourselves in a position where that player has either got a halo or they've got a horn. So this idea of halo or horn effect, and the the, the halo of horn is taken from sort of the, the halo like above above Jesus above God or the horn from the devil. So that the idea that they can't do nothing right or they can't do anything. Sorry, they can't do anything right. Easy for me to say. They can't do anything wrong, and they always do things right. That sort of, that that, um, that idea. A good one that's come in for that, Chris, is from Douglas Reed. It says, if a striker misses some chances and you rate him, they're just unlucky. But if they if you don't and they miss it, then obviously it's because they're, they're not got the ability or they're not up to standard. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Amazing. That the, the, and that's a great example of sort of the halo or the or the horn effect if you really like somebody and that's why i always put 
that example at the bottom, this idea of I know, I know, I know, but that's that, that's that, that's that great example of someone saying, yeah, 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 I know, I know, I know, but if they do well or if they do poorly. And that striker example is a really, 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 really good example. Now, Courtney, are you with us? I'm with you. Whether yeah, you yeah, there we go. There we go. Um, and I want to, I want to sort of share something with you, really. And this is sort of the, again, feel free for people to stick their answers up on here. What do we think these three players, apart from they've all got Portsmouth kit on in that example, what are these three three players have in common? We'll definitely come back to that question um, that guest six to eight asked around how we can weaponize the ine inevitability of confirmation bias to make good quality talent ID yeah. through, through the work we do around shared mental models. Yeah, they were also <laughs> and absolutely and, and and look, Harry Redknapp is uh, is coming up as the uh, as the example of this. I mean, but also yeah, professionalism. We we can see that Harry Redknapp definitely took these guys to multiple places. To multiple places with them and i think that's a really great example of the of the halo effect harry obviously felt that these guys brought something quite important to quite important to him um to the team that he was in that he was involved in um and he took them to to, to multiple places um now i wish i don't know what the, what the reasons for were with harry but there was definitely something that he saw which meant i need to take these guys these guys with me um, to hopefully uh, be successful at my at my next club. Really good example of, of the halo effect. Which kind of gets me onto onto this point. Really, um, we talked about the idea that, um, and in answer to your question, there is it a bad thing? Absolutely not. Uh, not a bad thing at all. Um, it's just a, an example of a of a particular of a particular bias. Um, for me, we go for, we go through a, a situation where we put labels on players. We then um, find ourselves in a position where we confirm or, or deny um, uh, what we see, and then we have this halo or this horn effect. And as a scout, I think it's really, really important, and as coaches as well, I think it's really, really important that you start to be aware of what are the things that really excite you about players. And what are the things that maybe sort of turn you off about players? What elements of them do you see that you go, yeah, I love that? And what elements have you see that you think, mm, I'm not quite sure about that? Because these are the sort of examples now where we can start to mitigate against some of our, um, our negative, I suppose our more unhelpful biases. Um, because if we start to be aware of them, we then might start to notice the things that we miss and the things that we don't miss. Um, and that's where that sort of that, that scouting team and that unit is um, is really really quite important. Does that make sense, Courtney? Yeah, it makes it makes real sense to me. And it's one of the things we do on a number of talent ID courses is to say, what are the things that that gets you excited about players? What are the things you look for first? What are you drawn to? Be it left-footed players, left-sided players, uh, dribblers. Is it people that win one v one duels? Um, and people mentioned it earlier. A lot of that's based on your own background, your history. Um, where you've come from, what you like, who you grew up watching. Um, so it's not something that should be taken as a negative in any way sense of, uh, of the thing, it's just understanding it. Um, and I'm sure you'll talk later if it's around kind of cognitive diversity and how you can get a team with differing views on differing players um, and how that will help us, I guess, make the most of our biases to, to identify players. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. So let's move let's move past that question. So I want to get to one of the sort of final biases, which sort of links us into how this all, for me, um, starts to connect to connect together. Um, and this idea of uh, uh, fundamentally jumping on the bandwagon, um, which is our tendency uh, for people to do something specifically because others are doing it, even if it goes against our beliefs. Um, so if we again play through the play through the model, we put a label, we see behaviors that confirm or deny, 
in that point we then find ourselves where we have a halo or a horn um, over that player and then typically we'll then go and start telling telling stories about it um, but not just us is we'll then go and try and reinforce stories that we hear um, it, with other people and what other people are saying about about players um, and for me the really really nice thing uh, about the idea of the bandwagon if you can start to, to notice yourself telling all these stories that are aligned to your views on players um, start to recognize when actually are there other views that can be quite helpful in starting to give us um, um, give us a, a broad picture on that human being I agree and I guess uh, my challenge to people is to see when they are a jumping on the bandwagon as you've said Chris but also recognizing it when other people are doing that for a player as well and hmm. um, we've all been in conversations around selection where the uh, the highest ranking person in the organization said yeah I like him or like her um, and then everyone else goes yeah agree great great choice as opposed to making their views heard yeah look, the um for me i'm trying to i think we've got um we've got a slide that uh that sort of highlights this which is in this scenario here i mean we find ourselves and 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 roy your your comment is such an important one here at this point about um uh, football is all about opinions and some will agree with yours and some will disagree um Typically, where we find is when heads of recruitment or when managers or more senior people have a strong opinion um, on a player. Um, how safe do we feel in the room to offer a different perspective? How safe do we feel to say, "I'm not, I'm not quite sure about that." We know that we live in it. We, we live and we work in an environment um, where, at times, we want to make sure we stay safe in our job. Um, we're a little bit. We can be a little bit worried about the opinions that we that we might offer. Um, and I think we're going to touch on it towards the end, just a little bit around psychological safety and this real sense that when we're making um, really, really important uh, decisions on whether we recruit players or whether we keep players or whether we pass players through the pathway, feeling safe enough to not just jump on the bandwagon because the manager or, or someone important has a view, to be in a position where we, uh, we sort of can challenge that view a little bit. I think is I think is crucial, really, really important. You're right, Mike, and it comes back to some of the comments we've made around evidence ev evidence informed. Um, so if you are going to challenge people's opinion, which can be quite ch difficult to do, it's worth mm -hmm. having your opinion backed up with some form of objective data and objective in insight. I oh, would yeah. suggest uh, completely. And, um, and look, we're gonna we're gonna I'm gonna show you a, a short video to really really emphasise this point. And this doesn't just happen in football, by the way. Human beings are again. I've talked about a few things that were that were built to do. Is we are absolutely built to conform. We are social animals, and actually, what we would like to do is just is just often. And this is for the majority, not all, but the majority is just conform and just blend in um, because it gives us a, a slightly less fearful and and and, and hopefully a less anxious a less anxious life. The ASH experiment is one of psychology's oldest and most popular pieces of research. A volunteer is told that he's taking part in a visual perception test. What he doesn't know is that the other participants are actors and he's the only person taking part in the real test, which is actually about group conformity. Please begin. The experiment you will be taking part in today involves the perception of line length. Your task will be simply to look at the line here on the left and indicate which of the three lines on the right is equal to it in length. So, for example... If you the actors right have been told to match the wrong lines. The volunteer will be monitored to see if he gives the correct answer or if he goes along with the opinion of the group and gives the wrong answer. In the first test, the correct answer is to... Uh, one. 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 Two. One. Once again, the correct answer is two. Three. 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 The ASH experiment has been repeated many times, and the results have been uh, supported again and again. We will conform to the group. Again, we're very social creatures. 
we're very much aware of what the people around us think. Uh, we want to be liked. We don't want to be seen to rock the boat, so we will go along with the group. Even if we don't believe what people are saying, we'll still go along. One. 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 Group dynamics is one of the most powerful forces in human psychology. I've uh, I've always enjoyed enjoyed that video. Well, I think we lost Chris now. It's his turn to to drop out. Back, Chris. Yeah, back in. Oh, the are we back? Are we in? Yeah, I'm back yeah you're back. back. Right. Oh yeah, I've always loved that video. I've always loved it when there's that guy's face and he's like, "What? What? Like, how are you seeing that?" And then I love the fact he just conforms. And for me, that's such an important example of um, of the bandwagon effect. It's that you, we, we want to conform. We are social animals and we'd much rather um, uh, conform to situations. And uh, look, we want to be in a position where people feel safe enough to offer all of their views and not jump on the bandwagon. But again, it's, it's just a natural bias um, uh, that, we, that we have. And, and there's a comment here from, from Dave again around the hippo. Um, now, that's something that, that fits into this kind of bandwagon effect, doesn't it? Actually, in terms of the hippo being the highest paid person's opinion um, and the fact that they are often sway a group in certain directions because they are the most senior ranking person. Um, oh. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm glad you I'm glad you just described hippo to me then, mate, because I don't um, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I was I was struggling a little bit. But yeah, obviously, the, the highest paid person often people um, um, uh, people often uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, resort to and wait for their wait for their opinion if um if uh, for people that are asking about that, that video by the way i've just put it in the, um, in the chat box if, um can you I know, of course you just put, yeah, yeah. put the link in the chat box that's uh that's where you're that's where you'll you'll find it and yeah for gozi that studies psychology absolutely I'm, I, I expect you to you might have seen that seen that video that video before I think we've yeah. alluded to some of that, Courtney, don't you? Some of these Yeah, sort of definitely. I, just, I would just urge people to take a, a minute just to think about when you recognise it in your club's context, when you recognise it happening to yourself, and then your strategies for maybe thinking about how you might deal with it. It's a really good point from Sean. Once you have conformed, it's really hard to then go back, isn't it? Yeah. And this is where um, environment is so is so crucial. And, and I, one thing I'm, I'm quite mindful of in this this webinar is getting to a stage where we can be really clear on on some like uh, ways around this stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I wanted to to make sure people were clear on for me what are some of the most important biases that are at play when we are making making decisions on on players particularly. Um, what I would say in answer to your, your question, Sean, like that environment, um, if if your environment's set up appropriately, then you should be able to change your mind. Um, but that's not always um, not always easy. I agree. Okay, so should we? Um, we'll spend the next kind of the last part of the, the webinar exploring ways in which we can kind of combat and I guess um, make best use of these inbuilt heuristics and biases that we have. Yeah. Hence the so what slide. So what? So how do we overcome these? Now we've got we've got sort of six things um, that we think are really important. Um, Courtney, I'll go through the first couple, and then do you want to do sort of multiplies multiple times and some of your sort of understanding around around that area? Yeah, no problem. So, um, look, I think it's already been alluded to a little bit earlier on, is where you can use data to check and challenge your views. Uh, this is where data can really be a be a friend um, and get and get and get chummy um, with uh, with people that are your are your are sort of the holders of data in these instances, just to check and challenge. Actually, how many times did he receive the ball in possession? How many times did he look to play forward? How many recovery runs did he make? Were they sprints? Actually, like have a look uh, at the data that fits around that alongside what your view of that game was. 
Yeah, and I'll just add to that, Moshi. It doesn't always have to be like uh, really scientific in terms of opta outputs and, and things like that. It can be simple notational analysis or getting someone to review the game a second time if that's an opportunity to do that. So it isn't always going online and getting the kind of full package of data on everything. Um, some of it can be quite crude and in the field work. Yeah, no, definitely. And um, and if you can get all the great data, brilliant. But if you can't and you just use some notational analysis, it's just another tool to help triangulate, isn't it? Which is really important. Yeah. Um, actively seek out people with different worldviews. Um, now, this can often be a hard one to do because often people that you know have a very, very different view to you aren't often always the people that you'll associate yourself with. Um, we often like to, to be associated with people that have a very similar view to similar view to us, and that happens in our friendship groups, um, et cetera. And that alternative view should absolutely be encouraged, but the difference between just hearing someone's alternative view or actively seeking out somebody that you know has a different view to you would be quite important. So when you're at games and you're looking at players, if you know somebody that often sees the game quite different to you, um, I think you should go up to them and, and ask a question. Now, whether scouts will always share information, I think um, I think that's that is up for debate, of course. But I think actively seeking somebody out that you know has a different view to you is a really really nice way to get around some of this. Yeah, and it's really important, I guess, in this age of information, where I guess if anyone's on social media, they'll follow people that they like, follow people that have similar views to them. It's actually quite difficult to sometimes find people with opposing views, um, but act actively doing that is going to help us, isn't it? Yeah. Um, okay, I'll, I'll crack on with the multiple eyes multiple times. So I guess it's a, a, a way in which you might think about actively seeking out people with different views. Um, one of the things we've done with scouting is try to get different people to look at players um, a number of different times and then using that insight to be able to correlate and check and challenge people's views. So if Marsh, if you and I go and watch the same player, we'll see the world very differently. We'll see a player very differently. But the opportunity to report on that player, to get insight and then for us to come together and say, what did you see? Oh, that's interesting. I saw something else. Um, we get a bigger and better picture of that player and it creates good conversations between scouts to hopefully have a better um, shared mental model. Um, which I'll lead on to perfectly for, for you. Raise yeah. that, uh, Corty, in terms of does the data lead to doubt? But we, we would argue that actually it gives you another tool to, to think about things in a different way. Yeah, it, it's absolutely, absolutely the way we'd like to think about it. It's something to check and challenge your view so you don't go down one rabbit hole. Oh, it might be that you think, actually, I've seen the data, I disregard it because my personal experience and my beliefs lead me to say that the player is going to be this. However, I would challenge you to just ignore it. Um, I think that's it's giving you a different reference point that builds a, a bigger, more broader picture. Yeah. Okay, Marshall, you want to talk us through kind of what we mean by shared mental models? Chris Harris. <laughs> uh, he's frozen at this point. Um, so the other thing, the other thing we've talked about as well with, with scouting that might be useful in terms of going back to multiple eyes multiple times is the opportunity to sit and, and watch games together and um, not necessarily talking to each other, but watching the game and understanding what each of you are seeing. Um, and especially with people that have go back to the one before people who have different opinions on players taking that time to watch a player, seeing how they see the world. If someone's got a preference for attacking players, um, do a co-scouting opportunity with someone who, who has a preference towards defensive players and just see different parts of, of, of the world. Um, I think Marcy's still frozen or is he back well, with us, Marcy? I think I'm back. I don't, I don't know. I, I seem to have froze. Sorry, did you? Yeah. We, let's get to, did we get to shared mental models yet? I was tearing you up and padding brilliantly for you to talk about shared mental models. Good news, good news. So, yes, yeah, so a shared mental models for me um let me let's try and bring this to life um as i mentioned as human beings uh we are designed to try and keep life simple and and our brain works hard to create shortcuts um and actually there are some really great examples within football of where there are lots of shortcuts so perfect example would be when a coach shouts the word break lines automatically people know what is meant by breaking lines can you find a way to get the ball behind the opposition either through a forward pass or through a penetrating one. We know that that's exactly what breaking lines is. Two simple words, easy to communicate, 
and the world of football pretty much knows what you're talking about. So for me, that's a wonderful example of what a shared, a shared mental model is. It's a common framework that gives you a consistent way of thinking so that people can understand that and you, you're basically on, on the same page. Now, that's, that is a little bit harder to do with psychology at times around whether we believe someone is showing resilient behaviors or not, whether somebody is, um, uh, is professional, is a hard worker, um, all those elements. What do we really mean by that? So one thing that I would absolutely encourage is um, really, really clean thinking. Are you really clear in your departments what you mean when somebody says, I think he is, he has a great attitude. I think he's got a wonderful character. This kid works hard. Whatever labels you decide, whatever characteristics you think are really important, make sure that everybody in your team knows exactly what that is because then it's open to far better check and challenge along the way. And how, how tactically, how do you do that? Like, is it just a case of getting in a room, watching football together, or how, how do we go about this practically? Yeah, well, I mean, from a psychological point of view, we know there are some characteristics that are really important, and, and what we would say is your differentiators. What other characteristics do we know the top, top players have as against to maybe the ones that aren't, aren't the top players? And, and it, let's say you get into something like, we know that conscientiousness, for example, which is sort of your diligence for, for alongside other sort of terms is really, really important. Then let's have a list of the behaviors that we know are aligned to that. If, if you've got to a behavioral level and we know this is what we can see in a player that's demonstrating conscientiousness or openness or resilient behaviors, if everyone knows what those behaviors are in your, in your, um, your staffing group, then it makes it a hell of a lot easier to make more objectives, objective decisions on it. And that for me is how you go. So get to a point where you think, um, what is it that we think is important? Technically, tactic, you can obviously use the, use the four corner models. And I'm sure there are many, uh, many clubs that are doing this already. But then be really, really clear on what you think the behaviours are that are aligned to each of those things that are important. Once you've got that clarity, you can then make sure that when people are reporting on it, talking about it, telling stories about it, the stories are more functional and uh, we're in a position where actually the data can be, and your data, when I say data, I mean like the stories that you tell is exactly, stories is data in the same way that numbers is data. Um, uh, it can be validated and can be checked and challenged. So I think this is a really like really practical thing that clubs and, and individuals can think about. Um, one of the things Eddie Jones did when he was first um, with England Rugby was to get the coaches in watching games together um, and talking about the game, understanding players, understanding their psych behaviours, their physical profiles, um, and spent a lot of time investing up front to be able to then go out and understand that they were all talking the same language. They had the clarity of talking about. So spending time watching games together, watching the same games, watching the same players is investment in the long run. Yeah, no, definitely. And when we... Um... Uh, and and uh, a, a lot of teams um, follow the same processes at, at the FA. Um, but one thing that we we, um, we at times often get to do is when we get new coaching groups together, is get them to to watch the games together. Um, to, when we are debriefing games, we're looking to create content for players. Is to watch the games together. What are you seeing? Maybe go away and do your individual clips as well. Then pull it together and talk about it. But get into a position where we're starting to to um to talk about the same thing now we risk we risk things like confirmation bias um with, within that that's where the shared mental models are really important and and bag and a bandwagon effect yeah absolutely and we do risk it we risk it all the time because they're uh, they're, they're, they're important and like i say the the mental shortcuts are there uh, in order to try and make our life our life easier yeah. um and constantly having debates all the time about what we see is not always healthy easier either yeah. Um, but those, those mental models are important. Okay, great. Well, if I, I'll touch on decision-making diary, um, actually, if you take cognitive diversity. So one of the things that um, I guess a lot of the literature would suggest is making a note of your decisions, like making a note of the players that you've recommended, um, looking back over time at the uh, who they are and trying to identify where the commonalities are. Um, that way we're able to kind of understand where our preferences lie. If we've got a preference for um, players who have certain tendencies for um, gritty players, like I, my preference would have been towards players that show some resilience or what I termed as resilience in their play. Um, but also then you're looking for people with, they want flair, they want a one-off spark. 
other people might want consistency in their in their actions. But it's worth kind of keeping a diary of all the decisions we make, all the recommendations we make to be able to refer back to in time. Um, it's a really easy thing to do. Just keep a notepad and a pen, uh, keep a log of it, and then just reflect on it every three months, every six months, however long it might be, to look at your trends in your in your recommendations and your players that you're bringing through. Yeah. I think I think I think it's great decision decision making diaries. You'll really start to see what are the bits that you you really like and what are the bits that that maybe you you might miss out on because you don't yeah you don't uh, you don't talk about it that often. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, Dave, Dave Bailey's made a good point about grading players. So would you yeah. start to weave that within that and and what's your sort of view on that? I'll let you go, Corey. I'll, I'll say that one. I, I think it's really useful. My personal opinion is um, we have to kind of make a judgment on players at some point and make a grade, um, provided that grade's able to be moved, depending on how many times you see them. If the context changed, the context has come up a lot of times here, and it does. I think it just gives us a reference point, something to go back to, um, to see where we graded them at that time and for what reasons. Um, one of the things we've done to understand scout behaviour previously is to see where everyone's grading was and see if there were trends in the grading, whether they ranked, let's say, um, skillful dribbling really high and therefore rank that player as a yes, I'd recommend. You can look back and then go, OK, you've ranked all the people that you've ranked high in dribbling, you've said yes to. So that may be something we can explore as something that's your preference. Not bad, not, 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 not necessarily good either but just a way in which we can look back at, at past decisions. So I, I, I'm personally for a grading system. Um, how frequently is up for debate. What the scale is, is up for debate. There's lots of different views and opinions, but I, I, I personally would see it as valuable. And just to caveat that, uh, another question coming in. So when you go and see your player for the second time, um, this individual tends to read back their first report in detail. What would your advice be? Is that a, a good thing, a bad thing? How can you reduce bias within that well i think there's a great there's a great saying that we see with our brains not with our eyes so even going to watch that game you're going to take that stuff anyway i would take it but also take it with a pinch of salt so not expecting to see the same thing so you've seen what you've written last time be aware of these unconscious biases be aware of confirmation bias halo horn and check and challenge your view from the first time um i i, I don't see it as any problem rereading it i think it's actually quite a good thing to reaffirm what you saw as strengths areas for development it's a good way to track development as well so you reread it and said i think this player needed to be better in his one we won duels you go to the next game and you see he's improved that's a great indicator of, of I, what i think is potential cool. okay I, 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 I think that's uh, i i wouldn't see it as being the right or wrong thing to do i, I think courtney yeah. you've, you've articulated like, articulated it really well um the bit i'd add is particularly around the halo horn like if you really like that player first time around and may actively look at the things maybe where they could develop, like try and just get a different perspective on it. You can look at the same player with it with a different lens. That's for sure. Yeah, brilliant. OK, and I'm going to leave you the grand total of a, a couple of minutes to talk about the, the big topic of cognitive diversity. Yeah, no, look, I mean, what I will say is that it's a topic that I'm developing my knowledge on at the moment. I wouldn't say I'm an expert in this area at all. Um, if you um for those of you that are again it's not on the reading list and, and maybe it's something that we can we can we can add um matthew syed's most recent book around rebel ideas talks about cognitive diversity oh courty there look at that um, well, okay. about, um cognitive diversity and and the bit that i was going to reference this evening just 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 for it for everybody listening in is that um <sighs> The concept is known as what's called homogeneity, is that we tend to pick staff members who are like us. So when you're picking your recruitment team and you're looking to select the scout that you want to work with, um, try and actually actively pick people that you know have a different view on the game to you. It would be far easier through homogeneity to pick people that are that, that have similar views to you. And there's a difference between people having completely polar views on how the game should be played. What I'm actually talking about is people that you know have uh, differing views on what um, on, how, on, on how people go about the game. And when you're in that sort of position where you can check and challenge each other, there will always be a final decision maker. And that's really important. But if you can be in a position where you've got um, different views to create that cognitive diversity um, in your space, 
um, that will that will help hugely. And there's more and more growing research around teams solving problems quicker um, that are more uh, more sort of cognitively diverse than the ones that are those homo homo. I can never say that word, Corti. Homogeneous, homo homogeneous. Um, homogenous homogenous there we go getting late um, i enjoy i'm enjoyed watching that <laughs> no sorry don't watch that and when we've recorded that don't watch that back can you edit that bit yeah yeah, we'll yeah. Cut it out, yeah yeah thanks mate and i think i think the point from from right there about coaches and scouts tend to focus more on what players can't do rather than what they can do that's absolutely true that's a negativity bias playing playing out right there yeah. and that's another type of the biases we are culturally as 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 british people we are quite um glass half empty i guess culturally um so we will see things they can't do before what they can do so i'd urge you as much as you can to see what it is they can do um just going back to the cognitive diversity that that isn't just um kind of someone's got a different opinion it can be from different backgrounds isn't it different race different uh, genders as well as different ways of thinking yeah yeah definitely i mean like diversity full stop i think is useful um we're learning more and more now that diversity in the workplace and then most importantly, people feeling safe to share their views. The, the, the term psychological safety gets banded about quite a lot. The most important bit for me is that people genuinely feel comfortable to share their views. That diversity is, is, it is, is really important. Um, and there's accepting of those differing views. Um, again, if we go back to why we're here, that is to hopefully overcome some of the biases that we, that, that we, that we, may, we may hold. And, uh, and Mike, on your point, again, like I think Courtney's alluded to it, um, people will definitely look for negative views or more unhelpful views on players when they've got a, a horn effect on them uh, and they're looking to confirm that. Brilliant. OK, cool. So look, there's loads, loads of stuff to think about there. And I'd urge just to spend the next couple of minutes just asking any more questions you've got. Um, I'm going to just put the reading list up, Mike, if that's OK. There's some other slides here that we'll go into a bit more detail around some of the stuff we've talked about, but haven't necessarily had a chance to cover. So I'm just going to go back to the reading list and be able to share that with people. Um, but if anyone has got any questions, feel free to feel free to ask. Do you want me to share the handout now? Uh, please. Yeah, please, Matt. Thank you. So we've got a couple of minutes for questions. Feel free to for, to ask any before we kind of wrap up um, tonight's tonight's webinar. Um, just on the handout, it should have flashed up on the handout section. It'll put an, a notification there. It should be able to be downloaded right now. Um, any issues, give me a shout. So what I will say, I mean, some of, the, uh, some of those books on there, let's go into them. So Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow um, isn't, uh, look, it isn't the easiest read, I'll be, I'll be honest. It's not the easiest read at all. Uh, it took me three or four times to, um, to chew through this, but it's absolutely brilliant. Um, so have a little go on it. I think that's important. Seeing what others don't see. Now, we haven't really touched on that topic this evening. Um, Daniel Kahneman's work is fundamentally built that we have errors in our decision making. Gary Klein's work is fundamentally built on the idea that we um, um, want to see the strengths in our decision making. So they are quite uh, conflicting, um, conflicting ideas. Um, but again, it's Gary, uh, Gary Klein's work is built on why intuition is really, really important. Um, and I wouldn't I wouldn't miss out on that either. Um, I'm going to pause. There's a few questions coming up through here, which uh, Matt, you might need to answer. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna reshare it just for those ones that can't. So the handouts in the top right hand corner is that right, Matt? Yeah. So I'm just gonna reshare it just to refresh it for for those that uh, can't see it. It should have come up again, so it should say where the handout section is. There'll be a little notification. Um, you can download it there. Well, thank you for the positivity, everyone, so far. That it's great to hear that it's landed well and you've enjoyed it. That's um, that's really helpful. Thank you for that. Um, Court is one question I can't answer. Um, actually, there is. How do we deal with parents, with players, players of parents with a bias towards us coaches? Does that, 
How do we deal with parents of players, should that be, rather than players of parents? How do we deal with parents of players? Ugh. Parent relationships, that's another webinar course, isn't it? Parents of relationships. Last moment. Headphones on again. Um, that is definitely another webinar all in itself. Um, and uh, but what I will say, parent, parental relationships are crucial. Um, uh, yeah. I don't want to spend too long opening up a topic which we could probably talk about for ages. Um, but empathy is a skill as human beings which we have to develop. We might not. We might not agree. We might fundamentally disagree with what that other person is saying to us. But if we can, if we can find a way to put ourselves in the other person's shoes, be empathetic towards their view viewpoint, it helps. You might not like it. As a, as a psychologist, I'm, not, I'm naturally not empathetic. I had to learn it. It took me a long time. Ask my, ask my wife, I'm, at times I can't be particularly empathetic. Um, but if, uh, if you can learn that skill, um, it will have a, a huge impact on your ability to, your ability to coach. Uh, just a just a few bits on the, the obviously future webinars that we've got on the screen. Um, there's there's various uh, topics, stuff ranging from a licensed content that we deliver, and then we try and put a different lens on it. Um, so there's a psychological lens on build the attack. So what are the the key profiles that players need to to show to to demonstrate that skill successfully, and then we we take other topics that are of interest. So there's these are the the foremost. Uh, upcoming ones there is future ones so i would I'd advise to check on the boot room um, and also check these links obviously on the handout as well um, if you if you like the style tonight they'll they'll all be the same 90 minutes um, with... still cool. massive. still struggling so i'll just uh, i'll share the boot room link now with you um, so just check on there the cpd page for for any upcoming webinars that I, that I delivered well i think i know courty is education leader probably should be signing off but i think he's having a bit of a um a bit of an issue with his headphones again these apple products they let you down don't they they let you down um thank you feedback is absolutely uh, requested so um matt you'll probably know the best method for feedback yeah, so I've fielded a few questions in terms of um, people that have registered guests. It shouldn't have uh, let you do it, but I've, I've took the email address and contact numbers and, and names of them. So um, they'll be obviously registered CPD. We've got the register list at the start, which will we'll give CPD hours for as well. So, um, yeah, if there's any any further, just, just let me know or email education at the FA.com uh, and, and we'll follow up with that. And thank you. You can hear me now just for a safe thanks. I think that was a thanks from Corey. <laughs> I think that was a thanks to me, yeah, as well. I think so. Um, it was indeed. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I don't think there's any more questions that can be. Thanks all. Really enjoy. Appreciate this being one of the coaches during the pandemic. Yeah. Um, Yeah, so I, I, will, I will say, stay safe, everyone. Absolutely, stay safe. Look after yourself, and uh, hopefully, football gets back, um, gets back to where where we want it to be. And and you guys that are scouts out there or coaches can get back to doing what you what you absolutely love love doing. Um, so, um, thanks for your time as well. We appreciate it. Yeah, I guess any feedback on the the process is, is really beneficial because it's so we're going to be moving to. To this moving forward so yeah any uh, any feedback's greatly appreciated good well matt do i know how does this work now hey do i just drop out yeah you, you can do i'll leave it open for any that just need to answer any questions or anything but yeah i'll uh, sort that